The uh, Abhidhamma teachings recognize four planes of consciousness, or four levels of, of, of mind. That's the um, Kama Bhumi, um, Rupa Bhumi, Arupa Bhumi, and Nibbana, the unconditioned. The um, Kama Bhumi is the sense, desire, or sense experience level of consciousness. And this is the ordinary uh, default mode of consciousness for human beings, as well as for a, a wide range of other types of beings. It's the most variegated kind of level of consciousness. And it includes uh, animals, beings in hell, ghost beings, as well as devas, the gods of the sensual planes. So this is an extremely wide range of uh, <coughs> states of mind that we class within the sense desire sphere. And human beings are in the middle of that and function mostly in that modality. It's the most complex type of mind. It's complex and uh, constantly changing and shifting. So it has a tendency to bewilder beings. Uh, you're caught in the confusion of all these variegated sense impressions and inputs. And beings are that exist in this level are caught between the um, poles of pleasure and pain. They're driven by fear and fascination. And have within that, um, in, in reality, very little freedom. Because they're overwhelmed by the uh, sense impressions, sense desires, and fear of unpleasant or painful experience. So it's the, the carrot and the stick. And uh, the, the being is caught in that. As we ascend to the higher planes of consciousness, we're moving always from complexity uh, to simplicity, from the gross to the subtle. And this is uh, an important principle that um, underlies a correct understanding of the spiritual path. People tend to, I think, take it sometimes backward and they think of higher states of consciousness as something 
additional, some kind of add-on that um, needs to be found or attained. And it's, it's a better model to think of progress on the spiritual path as purification and simplification. That by shedding layers of complexity and confusion, we are coming closer to uh, a more fundamental, a more um, primordial state of mind, a more natural state of mind. There's a image that's often used in Tibetan Buddhism of the blue sky, the blue sky mind. That the um, the blue sky is very beautiful and pristine and clear, and it's always present even on a cloudy day. It's just obscured by the clouds. And if the clouds are dispersed, then the blue sky shines forth. So the various defilements of the mind are like the clouds that just prevent the um, pristine reality of the clear, expansive mind from shining forth. The second level of consciousness is called the uh, uh, Rupa Bhumi, the realm of form. It is called that to distinguish it from the third, which is the formless Arupa. The realm, the uh, realm or plane or level of form, is a transcending of the sensual basis of mind. That the input of the senses is uh, less uh, prevalent and. Is um, uh, not a motivating factor for the mind that's in that that existence. That one has transcended sensuality, and this in for a human being, <coughs> this level of mind is experienced in um, deep samadhi in the state. Uh, we call jhana, which is uh, a unification or a stabilizing of mind. And um, there are four levels of jhana. And these are successively uh, deepening degrees of samadhi and uh, a progression again of simplification and purification. <coughs> First jhana has five factors and uh, overcomes or suppresses five uh, hindrances, nivaranas. And um, the absence of the uh, hindrances in the mind allows the mind to naturally settle into jhana. So um, first I'll uh, like to explain what is meant by samadhi, which is the state or the quality of mind that we're moving into, we're deepening as with uh, meditation. and. Uh, the perfections of, of samadhi is, is jhana. I would uh, caution you that a lot of the standard English translations around these terms are, are tend to be misleading. 
and one should be careful not to be led astray or to real overly rely on the English translations. Samadhi is usually translated as concentration, and I really like to get that right out of the vocabulary. I don't like that translation at all. Samadhi is defined in the old text as non-wavering. So we could say stability of mind, the stillness of mind. Concentration implies a narrowing of mind, and this is where I, I find a lot of meditators go wrong because they try and constrict their mind down onto the object. And this is very um, counterproductive. It only works for a short time, you become rapidly exhausted and the mind goes to pieces. The mind in jhana is an expansive mind. It's wide open. The equivalent to a mind in jhana on the uh, cosmological planes is a Brahma being. The Brahmas are very high level of beings that have totally transcended sensuality. So they don't eat, they feed on bliss. And they have no uh, gender there. They are, there is neither male nor female. They are reckoned just as beings. They only have the um, senses of sight and hearing. And they only, that's, those only are functional for them. They have no desire for sense objects whatsoever. And theirs, theirs is not a small and narrowed mind. It's said that a, a Brahma being can survey 10,000 world systems like a man holding sesame seeds in the palm of his hand. Well, so this is a wide open mind. And the equivalent mind for us is the mind of jhana. So we're not trying to narrow the mind down, but we're trying to still it, to stabilize it. So it's non-moving, it's resting on a single object. So this is the first practical point to emphasize in terms of meditation, is it's better to think of <coughs> filling the mind with the object. If we're meditating on the breath, it's the physical sensation of breathing. Let that fill the mind. Don't try and narrow the mind onto the breath but try and fill the vast expanse, the oceanic vast expanse of mind with the breath. So that there is only the breath in the vast infinitude of expanse of the mind. There is only the breath. This is the goal to be working towards. <clears throat> and this is only done by uh, making quiescent the five hindrances, nirvanas. As long as the nirvanas are present in the mind, one cannot enter jhana, one cannot experience deepening samadhi. It's the nirvanas that block us from doing that. <clears throat> and these are, first of all, sense desire. And this is to be understood not only in the gross forms, like fantasizing about pleasant sense objects, but any, of course it includes that, but it's also mild, subtle forms of sense desire, like uh, being, being um, uh, attached or concerned about comfort in the body. So being, um, it, you know, wishing it was warmer, wishing it was colder, wishing, wishing the seat was softer or firmer. You know, these are um, forms of sense desire. The mind is still going out through the sense doors, taking an interest and concern and being motivated by sense objects. And jhana is a transcending of sense objects. 
So it cannot, samadhi cannot deepen while there's a relation of the mind to an interest in the senses. The second uh, hindrance is uh, ill will or aversion, any kind of negativity of mind. And it's um, primarily a flip side of the first one. So if one is um, feeling irritation, irritability about the discomfort in the seat or noise outside or um, you know, whatever it might be, then it's negativity is also, it's a kind of a negative or reverse sensuality and it's also holding us back keeping us tied to that sense, desire, mind level. And as long as we're focused on that, that kind of stuff related to the senses, we're not going to transcend that level. We're just going to constantly sit in that level of pleasure and pain and not transcend it. <clears throat> then the uh, third one is uh, sloth and torpor which is dullness or laziness, sleepiness, and the heaviness, darkness of mind. We need to brighten the mind and wake, wake up, be clear, and not succumb to sleepiness, dullness, drowsiness. Um, this is very, very uh, difficult to shake off once you've succumbed to it. You just keep sliding deeper and deeper and have to take some major effort to get out of it. But uh, if you fi find yourself going in that direction, then uh, first thing is posture is very important. To sit straight, keep the back straight. Don't allow yourself to slump and slouch and be lazy in your posture. Try and wake up. Then uh, anxiety and worry is the fourth one, which is the uh, uh, nagging of the mind, the mind caught in worldly concerns and going back and forth and like a dog worrying a bone, you know, caught in thought formations thinking round and round about uh, issues and problems and concerns. And one needs to break that and just not, not uh, get caught in that kind of thinking patterns. And the final one is a skeptical doubt or uncertainty, which is uh, in uh, practice is uncertainty about the, the meditation. If one's going to make progress in the meditation, you have to commit yourself to it. If you're doubting whether it's of value or doubting whether you're doing it right, then you know, you're not going to make headway. You're just going to be endlessly caught in that sort of um, level of, of concern, of uncertainty. You have to devote yourself to it, just give yourself, surrender to the practice. So to um, practice the meditation, the uh, samatha meditation or meditation of developing samadhi, the idea, the uh, fundamental idea is that one takes an object which is initially an arbitrarily chosen object. And the most commonly done in our tradition is the breath, though there are other, uh, other methods that, that also work, but we, we commonly use the breath. And there are some different variations about how, how one may use the breath. 
Um, <clears throat> but the, probably the most uh, standard method is to be aware of the movement of breath past the gateway of the nostrils. If you watch the breath or, or actually feel the breath going in and out of the, uh, the nostrils past the point. So you make the nostrils are like the gateway the passage and you're still resting your, your mind at the, at the nose tip and watching the breath pass in and out or feeling it actually, feeling the breath. Because what we do with any kind of samatha meditation is we take an object that we can narrow down to one sense base. And this particular meditation we're using the tactile base or the sense of touch. So you just aware of the physical sensation of breathing. And you have to learn the skill of non-attention. You don't pay attention to anything else, anything else which arises in the mind. You just uh, disregard it. So you're trying to fill the mind with the breath. And it's a subtle practice you don't want to tr you don't try and suppress anything you just disregard it so the mind you shouldn't be forceful with the mind it's gentle make the mind open and receptive to the sense of touch of at the nose tip of breathing and disregard everything else and naturally, at first, there's many other objects, sounds and smells and sensations elsewhere in the body and thoughts in the mind. But if you disregard them, then they become quiet and less and less impinging on the mind. And you let the mind fill more and more with this one simple sensation of breathing. And be on guard for falling into the hindrances. Don't get caught up in the senses, particularly. We're trying to transcend the sense base. So don't be, don't let yourself become concerned about uh, the body or sense experience in general. Just disregard it and stay with the the one single object sensation of breathing. Now, the definitions, the definitions of uh, the jhana states, are there four, four states of jhana within the, uh, the Rupa Bhumi, and they, each one is successively s simpler and more purified and subtler. And there's nothing added to the mind. We're getting back to a more simple and basic level of mind. Um, so with the entry into the first jhana, we've transcended the five hindrances. And by doing that, we've transcended the sense desire realm, the level of mind that relates primarily to the senses. We've shifted beyond that. And the mind has five factors. It has Vitaka, Vichara, Piti, Sukha, and Ekakata. Vitaka and Vichara are functions of mind that relate to thought. <clears throat> Vitaka is striking the object, and Vichara is holding the object. So the Vasudhimaga has numerous similes to try and explain with Taka Machara and the difference between them. One of them is that with Taka is like striking a gong and Machara is like the steady tone of the gong. Uh, 
another is like uh, with taka is like holding a, a an object, uh, and uh, with chara is like um, or uh, polishing the object. So there's different. The, the, the one with the gong, I think, is the most easiest to understand. Because what we're trying for is that steady tone. And if you keep banging on the gong, you're not going to have a steady tone. You're just going to have a racket. Right? But if you don't bang it occasionally, the tone fades. Right? So, Wataka is a little bit more forceful than Wachara. Wachara is just steadily holding the object. And uh, with Taka is bringing the mind onto the object. So this is another point of uh, practical application to meditation is to learn a balance of with Taka and with Chara. That mostly you should just be quiescently holding the mind. <coughs> but if the mind's wandering away, you have to apply a little with Taka, bring it back to the object. But you try and use Wittaka sparingly because it's the coarser form. <clears throat> Wichaka and Wichara are also the, they are the, the energy or the mental functions behind thought. So Wittaka and Wichara being present in first jhana, there still remains some trace of thought in first jhana. And the factor of piti and sukha are also related to each other. Piti and sukha are forms of, of um, uh, joyful happiness, a joyful feeling. Uh, piti is sometimes translated as rapture. It's the uh, energetic kind of um, flow in the body-mind system. I think it's related to, it's maybe not exactly the same, but it's closer, close parallel to what in other systems they call Kundalini energy. It's a kind of internal energy in the body-mind system that has an uplifting quality. And it's felt in different forms. It's, it's primarily a mental faculty in, in that it's a brightening, uh, clarifying of the mind in that which has a joyful, uplifting feeling, but it has bodily correlates and that you will feel in the body different sensations, particularly like spine rushes or a sense of lightness of the body, of floating, tingling. You know? um, and this, this is a natural outflow of the, when the body-mind system becomes quiet, there's this natural outflow occurs. It's compared in one place to um, if we have a, uh, a mountain, a uh, lake in the mountains, and um, no rain falls into the lake, but it's constantly filled by a uh, spring from under, under the earth filling the, the lake. And uh, sukha is a refinement of that, and that sukha is a peaceful state of mind, a bliss, blissful state, but it's not thrilling or changeable or energetic in any sense. It's just an expansive kind of oceanic happiness, very peaceful. And the only bodily correlate is a feeling of complete ease and well-being in the body, but there's no sense of movement or uh, uh, changeableness attached to it. And the final fifth factor is ekagata, and this is another one where the standard translation, I think, misleads. You'll see it in books translated as one-pointedness. And grammatically, that's a possible breakdown. A Pali is, uh, uses a lot of compound words, and sometimes they're ambiguous as to how they can be 
parsed or separated. And I, uh, I think it's equally valid grammatically to, call, to say it's um, gone to oneness, gone to unity. The mind has is not. It's not that it's one pointed, but that it's unified. It's not divided against itself. So it's filled with a single object. This is the stability, the non-wavering of mind. It's ekagata. The mind is completely unified. So those five factors compromise first jhana, and it's simpler more subtle than sense desire consciousness and then second jhana is simpler than that more purified in that vitaka and vichara fall away so there's no thought conception possible in second jhana at all <clears throat> so um, one teacher came up with the guideline if you find yourself wondering, am I in second jhana, the answer is always no. <laughs> <laughs> uh. <clears throat> it's it's <clears throat> primarily marked by piti, so this is the very rapturous state of mind. And then uh, third jhana, uh, piti falls away, and one is has only uh, the factors of uh, sukha or bliss and, and um, unity of mind, ikakata. <coughs> In fourth jhana, bliss is transcended by equanimity or peacefulness of mind. So uh, even bliss seems too coarse to the mind. Now we're going with these progress through these four states of mind, we are o always moving from the coarse to the subtle and from the complex to the simple. That's a very um, important principle. And these are relative terms. <clears throat> They're not absolute terms. So with the mind in sense desire experience there's a range within sense desire experience of course to subtle and we can think of very subtle sensual experience like um, listening to a, a, a Mozart concert concerto you know, it's a sensual experience but it's a very subtle sense, sensual experience but uh, so there's even within the sense desire realm, there's a, a range from coarse to subtle. But then we make a, like a quantum shift into the realm of form. And everything in the sense desire realm is then seen by the mind as coarse. Any sensual experience, the mind just naturally sloughs, sloughs it off as being this is too coarse, this is gross, this is not, not subtle. So in first jhana, one has just transcended the senses. So there's a saying that uh, sound is a thorn to first jhana. The meaning is that sense experience is just outside the, the gate. We've just transcended it, but it's not very far away. So something like a sharp, loud sound can still disturb the mind and bring it down out of jhana uh, if it's not very strong or stable. But by the time we reach second jhana, the senses are very far away. But then it's thought is the thing that's just outside the gate. And it's possible the mind could be disturbed by a thought and lose second jhana. <clears throat> Thought is now uh, the thing that's coarse and gross and not desired, sloughed off by the mind. And then in third jhana, rapture is is perceived as coarse and gross. The mind is uh, naturally moving towards a more subtle state, a more purified, simpler state of existence. And then even bliss starts to seem coarse in the mind rest finally in the equanimity of fourth jhana. 
So there's a movement right through of the mind towards that which is simple, that which is pure, that which is subtle and refined. So when we're attempting to do this meditation, we should always be uh, on guard against letting yourself fall into grosser states of mind. Notice, you know, notice that the objects of the senses are coarse and don't, don't take an interest in them. look for the more refined, subtler states of mind. And it's not, as I said, it's not uh, creating or discovering anything new. It's really just uncovering a more primordial basic state of mind. In the uh, Digha Nikaya, there's a, a sutta of origins, the Ganya Sutta, which is uh, kind of like the, the, the Buddhist Genesis, essentially is the, the same meaning, uh, Ganya in Genesis means origins. And uh, it describes the beginning of this world system and the beings that became human originally were Brahma gods of the second level, Abhisara Brahmas, that uh, were curious and attracted to the um, nutritious foam that was floating on the oceans of the primordial earth. And they uh, tasted it with the tip of their finger and by doing so they took on coarse material form and fell to, to earth and became corporeal beings of the sense desire level and it, it describes a long process of uh, what we say devolution as they mm -hmm. gradually became coarser and more gross until they became the sorry specimens we know today <laughs> <laughs> But the, uh, the underlying idea here is that uh, if we take this mythology, you know, the mythological expression, when we are entering jhana, we're essentially remembering something from long ago. The, the mind is more basically, more primordially, unified in that sense and it only takes on it falls into complication and confusion and bewilderment of the sense desire level So I'll finish up this initial talk by giving some uh, instruction in meditation that leads into jhana. The uh, meditation on the breath, Anapanasati, is a very fundamental basic meditation that the Buddha said is suitable for all beings and is highly praised by him as sublime in the beginning, sublime in the middle, sublime in the ending. It's using as his point of attention a simple bod bodily process, the in and out breathing, something that goes on all the time as long as we're alive with breathing but most of the time we don't notice it. Now here we're just taking notice. The first thing is don't control the breath in any way. Don't try and manipulate the breath. 
Just let the body breathe as it will. Just let the breath be natural, unforced. And let the consciousness be filled with this physical sensation of the breath as it is felt at the nostrils. Don't follow the breath into the body or out of the body. Just rest your, your mind at, at the gateway and watch it going past. Just feel the sensation of the breath passing. And anything else which arises to the mind, just disregard it. You have to learn the, the knack or the skill here of non-attention. Just let it fade away into the background. This is quite different than if one's practicing Vipassana meditation. This is a different skill here. We're trying to just rest, have the mind in a state of ease and rest and peacefulness filled with a single object. If the mind wanders away, you lose contact with the object and apply Vitaka, just bring it back. This is just like a moment of light forcefulness in the mind. You just you know, get back over here leave it to rest in its place of contact and just let everything else fall away try not to be caught up or concerned with the sense basis other than the single exception you're allowing of the sense of touch at the nostrils disregard any other input from the senses particularly Try and keep the mind in a state of wakefulness and stillness and ease. Okay, so let's do that for we've got about 45 minutes left in the hour. We'll do this meditation.